uh, my name is Chris Goslow. It's a real privilege to be here. Yes, um, and um, and I, I really enjoy I really enjoy this topic of communicating anyway. I guess you could say as a teacher, as a writer, as a married person. You know, I, I find it very useful in my life to be a communicator. That's part of why why I wanted to give this talk. But oh yeah. We got our little money symbols there for fun, okay? And uh, talking money, the do's and don'ts of communicating about finances. To be clear, that I just thought would be a good attention getting title. Not because I'm presenting the comprehensive uh, answer for everybody. It's mostly just my thoughts and my take on this topic. And I know everybody here has their own, probably has their own, uh, whether you thought about this, uh, consciously or not and I'll be uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion afterward we'll be very eager to hear from others who have you know great wisdom to share on this topic because you all have your own experiences in this area so why this talk um, right so I, I mentioned uh, first of all that I, I do have a passion for communications I've always been interested in the topic of how to communicate better as a performer I'm a, a musician and also as a teacher it's really helped what I've learned in that air in this topic to help me, um, you know, do my do my thing in my career. But also, uh, I got I got married um, 11 and a half years ago. And prior to being married, uh, and I'm sure this is probably true for many people. Uh, all I had to think about was paying my bills. And uh, my, my, my view didn't really extend beyond that. Um, but in being married, you know, soon, um, the scope of what I what I felt responsible for and what I wanted to accomplish financially obviously expanded. And so um, in that process, I got very eager to take care of my own personal finance situation. I had some debt that had been sitting around for a long time, just kind of sitting there and, and, and kind of oppressing me. Uh, it was kind of in the kind of it, it was not the amount, it was the feeling of powerlessness that I somehow perpetuated. And maybe some of you can relate to that. Um, and it was in the, it was actually, you know, uh, it was some student loan and some, some credit card debt. And I got very interested in ending that and being married a few years actually helped get me motivated. It's kind of like a snowball effect of taking care of our finances. I got interested in handling my debt. Um, also, of course, I got interested in sort of planning ahead and retirement planning. I got, uh, got introduced to Vanguard and index funds. I got very passionate about this and I found Bogleheads and I met uh, Greg and others in an in-person meeting long ago here in Sacramento. Uh, and um, so in my, my passion was great, but what I found soon was that um, my desire for us to have an, uh, an about face in our finances and um, it, it ran into some walls and I had to learn the hard way that my wife wasn't necessarily on board with every single financial change that I suddenly knew because I had found, you know, I got the good news about cleaning up our finances and et cetera. And I learned the, you know, I learned the hard way that I had to modify some of my expectations and I had to learn how to communicate with her because, you know, telling her, Hey honey, by the way, let's, we're going to now save everything we can and not spend. Uh, you know, it, didn't go so well for a while. Was, and if you ask her, she will agree. It was pretty bumpy. Um, but of course, happily through uh, our commitment to uh, working on our communication, um, we, we got through that. I changed my attitude and we still have made a lot of progress and it's been an incredible. Um, uh, I guess you could say it feels like a financial um, uh, recovery story. And personally, it's meant a lot to me and I think to her as well. Um, and lastly, uh, as far as communication around money, I also found kind of similar reactions when, when talking to family and, and deciding, uh, you know, hey, I want to talk to you and help you with your finances. And uh, what I found was that people weren't necessarily in the same place I was. They weren't necessarily on board and excited to invest money in index funds for 30 years from now, et cetera, et cetera. The bogleheadish uh, view of financial well-being, which I felt so keenly, um, wasn't shared by everyone around me, uh, funny enough. 
And if you're nodding, maybe you've had some experiences like this too, because in my experience, it seems very common for this to be true. Uh, but I had to learn again the hard way, a lot of passion and sort of, I don't know if I was just naive or I was just thinking about myself. But um, again, it made me interested in learning about communicating about this topic better. Uh, and I'm still working on it, but I felt that this, um, this presentation could help me further refine some of my insights uh, and in my own communication. So, um, lastly, um, I, as I'm kind of alluding to here, I, I do feel that this is a shared experience. So everybody on this call, I'm sure you have your own stories, your own version of this, the experience of your money, knowledge about your finances and what you, the goals and priorities that you have and how it can differ from the people around you. And the, and the experiences I'm sure you have all had many, probably very different than mine, but maybe some of them you share. So um, I, I felt that this could be a good, I uh, could help facilitate or start a conversation on a, obviously a big topic and I'm no expert and I will not, do not pretend that I'm going to present the definitive way of talking about it. I tried to uh, pull together my own insights and quite a, some uh, different online, I did some online research, some articles and some other points of views that I brought to bear here. And obviously just felt that um, not, my role is not to be the expert, just but to be more a facilitator of a discussion. And again, um, I welcome your thoughts when we get to the uh, Q&A section later, but I want, felt that this will lay it out for you all and then we can uh, just hear what you have to say to even deepen this topic, which I'm sure it will do. Let me see if I um, missed anything here. Oh yeah, um, uh, I will touch a little bit on uh, talking money with children, but that's partly because Greg kind of bothered me about that and said, Chris, you need to put some in here about this topic because we don't have children. I'm definitely not an expert on it, but I know many of you do and your grandparents and parents. So obviously it's very, very important. So I will touch on that. But again, not so much from my personal experience as a parent, obviously, since I have none. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. So um, just laying out basics, I know you know Nothing here will surprise you, but where do we talk money? Um, who we talk to? So obviously there's family, spouse. I mean, we already came, already came up in the poll. You know, this is, this is kind of like the poll. Children, parents, extended family. We have friends and community. We have work. It could be coworkers, boss, partners, uh, financial team, advisor, estate lawyer, accountant, and ourselves as bogo heads. Now let me be clear here, where we talk money. Uh, I'm sure that if you like me, some of these categories, you probably don't talk about money much, or maybe like me, you've had times where it was challenging or it wasn't as easy, uh, you wish you could feel more comfortable about it. But again, I'm just laying out the areas where this topic I, I figure might come up and there probably are others, but this is what I came up with. Uh, secondly, what are the situations where we talk money? I mean, again, no surprise to anybody here. We got everyday money situations with our spouse and family, daily expenses, everyday negotiations, because it is a negotiation. After all, who's going to pay for dinner? You know, where, what, et cetera, you know, et cetera. What, how much to give the, the kids, which I wrote here, travel entertainment, allowance, you know, for the children and obviously other things too. Just, you get the idea, just, then we have the big and long-term kind of money situations, obviously weddings, special occasions. Again, a lot of discussion and negotiation may be happening for a wedding, obviously. Buying a house. Again, no surprise to anybody here, but these are the things that where it comes up. Savings and frugal habits maybe, and, and I wrote this up here uh, because the idea of sharing maybe with our spouse as we talk about our habits or maybe with other family members or the topic of maybe encouraging such habits, for example. Uh, obviously, you might have family or friends where the topic of debt, clean, paying off, or you, you working with your spouse on this topic, cleaning up your finances investing like we are here talking about on every month obviously estate planning with different generations grandparents parents children that can obviously be a big part of where families will talk money uh, and of course in your career with regard to your income or maybe your boss negotiations etc again I'm not intending this to be comprehensive or 
you know, in depth, but hopefully this paints a picture uh, of, of the areas we talk money. Okay, retirement planning, long-term goals. Let's see if I missed any. Okay, good. Okay, so if only everyone were, oh, go ahead. Obviously, I meant this kind of tongue-in-cheek, tongue, tongue in cheek, and as you can tell, this is Greg, um, our illustrious leader. No, um, it's uh, not Greg, but it's, uh, again, what I what I was saying here is, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, and and I think we all feel it, um, that it's, there's something very nice about how we come together with sort of a shared view of our ability to take care and, and be empowered, that's what I think of it, around money and our savings and our planning and our investing. Um, the reality is that we live in a bubble when we to come together and that the, most of the world, in my perception, and maybe you agree, doesn't have that experience. In fact, um, if it was easy for everyone to talk about money, why would I need to, why would I feel the need to to present on the topic. So let's unpack some of the money taboos and communication challenges around this topic. But first I wanted to do a quick quote. I found a great article on this topic uh, from The Atlantic, uh, why so many Americans don't talk about money. And it says, recent surveys, um, let's skip ahead, have found that in 34% of cohabitating couples, one or both partners could not correctly identify how much money the other makes. That's shocking fact number one. Uh, number two, that only 17% of parents with an income of above 100,000 a year had told or planned to tell their children how much they earn or their net worth. Um, that's number two. And perhaps even most revealing that people are more comfortable talking with friends about marital discord, mental health, addiction, race, sex, and politics than money. So in other words, if you think of all the taboo topics in the world, people are more comfortable talking about every other topic, every other taboo topic than money. So um, anyway, I need this to say, I felt this captures a lot about the state of money taboo, at least in our country. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to bet that all of you kind of know what I mean, that we, I don't have to elaborate too much on this, that you don't have to go that far to see evidence of this, and we've all probably experienced it. Um, so let's unpack further. Okay, <laughs> so that's a picture of someone dealing with some of these money taboos. Okay, I've got a quick list of kind of my thoughts on sort of what's behind the taboos. Again, it's just for general reference and to get us going. The first one I think is um, distrust. And I think it's fairly obvious when we think about it that there's a lot of dist distrust around the topic of money. It's very personal to people and probably historically and maybe even now, there's probably good reason to have to be skeptical of other people sometimes. And, and there often are um, uh, games that society, within society of people fearing if they tell people about their money, maybe they'll be judged, maybe they'll actually be taken advantage of. And obviously there's good reason for that. And I would say it's a big factor in why these money taboos persist and the, the challenges between people. It's just simply a lack of trust when it comes to talking about money. Uh, secondly, um, money brings up a lot of strong personal feelings. Obviously, it's very personal to us. Um, and, <laughs> okay, this might sound a little uh, critical, but we humans, we do have a tendency to kind of see our point of view and feel that what we know is uh, the right way. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but uh, it's, it's normal, it's human, it's not necessarily bad. It's just that if we forget that other people have different points of view, I do think that is a, a factor, especially with a topic as highly charged as money is. Um, okay, going on. Obviously, there are just differences in money personalities and financial goals from people to people, and it Clear. I think it's a big factor. Certainly what I noticed in talking to other people around me, I, and I didn't 
honestly realized this until I talked to people and learned the hard way that not everybody shares my point of view. And this especially about money personalities. We're going to get into that a little further. Uh, the second poll question was, was meant to start thinking about that. Um, but in fact, everybody is different around money. And I do think that can be a challenge in a, in a low trust, fearful environment where people aren't saying, hey, can't we all get along, you know, viva la difference, you know, that's not necessarily how society tends to operate. And I think it is a factor in why there's challenges and taboos is just differences in opinion. Again, this is my my take on it. I'll, again, I'm not saying I'm right, but okay, let's keep going. Uh, money obviously can bring a lot of, up a lot of shame and other negative emotions. Um, I'm gonna take a drink of water, let that sink in. And, and I say this from personal experience, it's definitely been true for me too. <laughs> Quite a lot of shame actually, and I'm not, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's just the part of my journey and that I've had to work through, uh, which relates to this next one, which I love knowing about, is the confusion over self-worth versus net worth. And I think this is a big one. Certainly it was for me. I think it's one that's very common. And I'm certainly interested in hearing your points on this, but I think a lot of people carry a lot of negative thoughts about themselves because maybe they don't they don't have the net worth that they wish they did or the money they wish they did, and they equate it with their worth as an individual, as a person, which is unconditional and does not change whether you are have billions of dollars or are billions of dollars in debt or the rest of us somewhere in the middle whether we're in the red or in the black, and to what degree, our self-worth does not change. But there's a lot of confusion about that in our society. I think you don't have to look that far to know that, and you, maybe you relate to some of uh, the experience of being confused over that, and some of you, and I certainly do. Okay, I think also it's, it's safe to say that there's, there could be a lot of personal significance, pride, and even competition that goes on between people financially. Surprise, surprise. Um, uh, throughout time and throughout history, I think it's a big factor in why uh, money can be a challenging topic. It's just because, and, and even within families and just people who know each other, and I think maybe you've all experienced some, some variation on this, you know, we create a lot of significance around money and it can become sort of a point of competition between us, which I think is also part of why the self-worth versus net worth can, um, can be a factor. Now, and I also speak as a man, and I would say very much, I feel that as a man, and that's just been my experience, even before I ever made any money, I, I somehow got ingrained into the notion of, uh, I guess, self-worth is your net worth or something like that, and the competition of that. So, um, oh yeah, and I think lack of confidence, I wanted to put this here because, um, you know, I didn't think of it until uh, late in as I was writing my notes here, but I do think this is a real factor. I think there's a lot of uncertainty around money and a lot of people just are not sure and they're not, they don't have these tools that we necessarily have. I did not have these tools 10 years ago that I now have and lack of confidence can be a big factor in why it's challenging for people to talk about money. They're not sure in, on on how they, how they feel or how they're doing. And again, I'm not, um, I'm just, uh, putting out here, maybe you have your own experiences or you've known people like this. Anyway, so these are what I feel are what I came up with around the, ta uh, the taboos and challenges around money. So what do we have here? Okay, um, from Psychology Today, this kind of sums it up, you could say. The common money issues include seeing money as your report card, a hard and fast measure of your self-worth as a person or using money to get back at a spouse, or letting issues, e.g. guilt and fear, your parents passed on about money, manifest as money problems for you in the present. Some people feel judged, believing that their respectability hinges on how much they have, whether it's earned or inherited, etc. Their competitiveness around money may be sabotaging their marriages or friendships in ways that are unnecessary and destructive. Okay, on that happy note, um, 
So I hope, again, just trying to lay a foundation here. Obviously, I don't know that any of this is news to anyone else. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this is kind of the undercurrent, the background that we've all kind of seen in our lives, if not personally, then maybe other people around you that you've seen dealing with some of these things. Okay, so now we're going to get to the kind of the meat of the talk, which is I'm going to start going through what, what I decided were for this presentation, the do's and don'ts of talking money. So I laid a foundation and the first one we're going to address is appreciate others unique money personalities it is the do. Side note, not side note. The don't is expect others to think about money like you do. Eh, we're not going to do that. Okay, so let me elaborate more on this. And this relates to the poll, the second question. Okay, so um, I found this article uh, from CNBC by Ken Honda, who wrote Happy Money, the Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. I'm not sure if you've read it. I have heard of it. I've heard of him. I haven't read it yet. But I'm very interested and he talked about seven money personality types okay this is his model i had heard of the idea of money personality types before and maybe you have too to some degree but i liked the succinctness of it and i did base the poll on it so let's get started with these the first one is he calls the compulsive saver which is meant to be represented by this the gentleman up on the upper right who you can see has holds a lot of money well, of course he's smiling so he's clearly happy and his compulsion is is working for him. But again, Ken Honda's uh, descriptions, again, these are just ideas. I'm not trying to say everybody here fits into one of these. This is not to, like for hard and fast. It's just a model. Okay. So take of it what you will. But he was noting that the compulsive saver is a personality type that, whoops, puts away money endlessly, sometimes with no actual end goal in mind, believes saving money is the only way to feel more secure in life and is very frugal. Actually, what happened in the article, he suggested that if you, if you have some of these traits, you may be a compulsive saver. And he said a little more, but I made it a little more succinct. So that's a compulsive saver. The next is the compulsive spender which who tends to spend money on things they don't necessarily need, has an outgoing personality and loves treating people to something special, sometimes for no particular reason. When in emotional distress, their solution is to spend, especially for immediate gratification. I think of retail therapy. Um, so that's the compulsive spender. Okay, moving on. We got the compulsive money maker represented by this <laughs> triumphant looking gentleman up on the right believes earning money is more money is the secret to happiness spends energy on trying to make as much money as possible and gets pleasure from approval and recognition from other people for their financial success for for that for the spent money makers success they get recognition for their success okay this is an interesting one the indifferent to money so rarely thinks about money. In extreme cases, believes that money is inherently bad or evil, feels strongly that money shouldn't influence important decisions in life. In another uh, model, I heard this referred to as a money monk. So, and I kind of like that too. It's like someone who's like above it all kind of thing. So that's indifferent to money. And then we have the saver splurger. Uh, this is interesting. Shares traits of the saver and the spender. Okay. They, but here's what they do apparently start out saving a lot of money, then gives into spending impulses out of nowhere. And when they use savings, they might spend on things they don't really need or will rarely use. Um, okay. Then we have the gambler represented by the woman up on the top right looking. Uh, very focused as she does her thing. Uh, by the way, these pictures were supplied through a website called Pexels, which is really quite amazing. All these great pictures, P-E-X-E-L-S. So the gambler shares common traits between money makers and spenders. Money makers and spenders. They get a thrill of risk and the promise of reward. That's a pleasure unto itself. They can quickly get lost in. They tend to gamble away money, sometimes for the purpose of, of escaping boredom. 
Okay, last but not least, we got the warrior. Whoops, sorry, I'm just, ah. I'm trying to get my Zoom. There you go. Bear with me here. I was just seeing a lot of uh, videos I need to get rid of. Okay, the warrior is constantly worried they will lose their money at any given moment. No matter how much they have, they lack confidence in their ability to achieve financial freedom. They constantly obsess over the worst case scenario of what will happen if they run out of money. Those are the profiles that Ken Honda listed in the article. And now we have the question, which one are you? So again, that was inspired by the article title itself, but we have our seven things. And by now I know you've already, you. You filled out the poll. You thought about it a little more. Um, personally, and I'm not too proud to say this, but it just happens to be true. I identify the most with the worrier. That was definitely me, especially before I discovered Bogleheads and this, uh, you know, these empowerment tools we have of financial planning and index fund investing. So that was me personally. Um, but the reason I wanted to share this exercise was more about recognizing, thinking for a moment about people in your life and which personality type they may be. Because odds are they aren't the same as you, especially someone who you've found any difficulty or challenge around talking about money. That would be my guess that there's some differences. So, and I can certainly think of differences in my life. I can think of a compulsive spender. I can think of a... I think indifferent to money, a family member who strikes me that way, a definitely a money maker, um, and, and a saver. So think about it for yourself for a moment again. And why am I um, setting this up? Because again, this is our money due. Our, our first money due is appreciate others' unique money personalities. And, um, and ex instead of expecting them to be like you, they are different and we are all different. And let's go back here for a sec. I mean, if we say, which one are you? And I already saw it in the poll. That a lot of people said they were a saver. And I don't know if they, you feel if you would change your answers after, we, after all the information that was specifically delivered. But I'm just not that surprised here on the Bogleheads forum or in this, this Zoom call that a lot of people identify as being a saver because here we are and, and fans of saving. We're sort of preaching to the choir of savings. And a lot of the world is not, is not going to fit that profile. So it stands to reason that they're not going to see things the way we do. So let's move on here to the second money uh, do and don't uh, of talking money, which is to respect others' money sensitivities. This does relate to the taboos and challenges I already listed. You kind of get an idea uh, of the, the, the issues that people might be having around money. We don't know until you get to know someone or if they share it with you. So let's not, I'm not saying anyone here would do this. Okay. I did this a little bit. Okay. Let's not steamroll others with your agenda for them. All right. So uh, no, let's not do that. So, and then to help out with this, um, this point, I just wanted to share um, this, some highlights of an article I read about how to support someone with financial empathy. Specifically, it was about someone with money problems, but I think it pertains whether or not they think they have money problems. So number one is, uh, again, I, I took this out of the article. It's not the whole article. By the way, I will share the links to these articles afterwards if, uh, on the chat. So if you wanted to look at the full articles, you can get more detail. So first one, listen without judgment and avoid offering unsolicited advice or criticism. So like I said, personally, what I found was saying, hey, if you save 20% of your income for the next 30 years, you're gonna have $2 million or whatever, uh, just put in index funds, you know, saying that to various family members or any variation of that, I realized just didn't work because <laughs> I was coming from a uh, unsolicited advice that no one asked for. Um, so I know from firsthand experience, this is a good one. Second one is offer emotional support. Let your friend know that you are there for them and that you care about their well-being. Um, I think that's, a, I have learned again, personally, this is better than giving unsolicited advice. 
Surprise, surprise. Uh, be respectful. Money can be a sensitive topic, so be respectful of your friend's privacy and boundaries. I would say this is probably what under the underpinning point of this whole talk is that because money is such a personal, uh, emotional thing and a sensitive topic, it is very important if you ever if you want to be successful communicating with others about it that you respect that they are they have their own take on it, their own privacy and boundaries, and to be respectful of that. It's very important. And, uh, you know, alas, you know, I, I think I did have a, a few missteps in this regard myself. Uh, hopefully I've, I'm cured of that. But, okay, be patient. Financial problems can take time to resolve. So be patient with your friend and offer on, ongoing support as needed. Let's play the long game like we do as investors. If you have people in your life you're committed to helping or, or, or being there for financially, let's give them time just like we do our funds, our index funds. We don't expect VTSAX to have 10% gains every single year because fortunately we have a long-term point of view and we can tolerate up and down and up and down all the way to the top. So I think it's a fitting analogy for how we could talk to people in our lives, to be patient with them because they're in their own place and they, uh, you know, patience goes a long way. Yeah, okay. Help them find resources. Uh, if your friend needs practical help, offer to help them. And then it's cutting out here because I got some thing on my own video covering it. But you can see there, help them if they need it. You know, it steer them in the direction of an advisor or debt service or organization that might help them. I, I personally, what I get from this is that we don't have to be the ones to save them. And I'm not saying that other people have here have felt this way, but maybe to some degree I might have. I think it's good to um, just pass along tools and ideas if, if they want help. Not to mention we may not be able to save them. And so it's kind of arrogant, and maybe I was this way, arrogant, and assuming I could save other people like, hey, just be like me and all will be well. Anyway, okay, so I hope this um, helps delineate this this concept of do's and of the second do and don't. Okay, we're gonna move on here. Meet them where they are. Now, this is the one I personally felt some success with, and and not expect others to be as intense and dedicated as you are about your finances. Again, this is very autobiographical. This is very much what happened for me. Didn't work. So let's meet them where they are. Um, and uh, let me, for this one, this is mostly my personal take on things. Uh, and I'll share a story too around this, a success story. So let's start small. Like I might have already said, not everyone, for example, is ready to take on, you know, contributing to their index, index funds in their IRA or even their 401k for the next 30 years, or even to think about 30 years in the past, into the future. What I've noticed is on these on our Bogleheads meeting, it's very common to think out 10, 20, 30 years into the future. But what I've noticed is out in the world, it's very uncommon for people to think this way. Has anyone else noticed this? It's certainly been my experience with friends and family. They're not, they're not, in fact, I've heard people shut down on me when I started talking this way. Because they don't, it's just not communicating. It's maybe too big, I guess is what I'm saying in this context. So instead, uh, for example, when I heard, uh, I read an article, or at least numerous articles and people talking about this, for example, you might encourage them to start an emergency fund because people can relate to that. Whether they, I, you know, the idea of having some savings can be a bigger change for some people and make more difference than, um, than trying to re think about retirement planning. I personally found that myself. And let's catch their interest. So what is a doable action that would make a difference for them right now? Again, sorry, it's coming from empathy and also it takes a bit of listening, not just us thinking we know. Small wins can build confidence in the area of money. And, it's, and that's what we want, isn't it? For our loved ones and friends or family, if the topic comes up, we'd like them to feel good about the topic. I mean, it's not about whether they have all the numbers, right? It's about the feeling of, of how it lives for them, I think. All right, so now I wanna share a quick success story. Um, my wife, she's uh, taken to using some savings apps to which help her automatically 
set aside money for investing, for like just cash savings, and even for her business as a photographer. Uh, and she really loves this. Now, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but in her case, and I, it was, I discovered these things, Digit, which has now changed its name, and Capital with a Q. These are two apps I discovered quite a while ago. I used them for a while. Honestly, I decided to stop using them because I would rather do it myself. and I didn't want to pay $3 a month for it, but that's me, okay? Frugal Boglehead. But my wife did not want to be um, hands-on like that, and she wasn't going to get that. If I showed her a spreadsheet, she would shut down. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, the savings app does this work for her, and she loves it. She also loves using her phone, which is part of why I was inspired to use a picture of a phone. Uh, and it does it automatically. And now she has more cash savings. You know, she's, she loves cash savings as well. It's a emotionally satisfying for her. And, you know, like the under the mattress kind of thing. And, you know, fortunately, some of it is also earning interest. But she's built this through these apps. And it's quite impressive to see. It's proof of concept. Uh, David Bach wrote a book called The Automatic Millionaire, um, which talks about how to you know, save a million dollars. And his central point is make it automated. And for many people, that's the only way that's going to work. I would, I would guess that on this call, there are more than normal percentage of us who are, are hand, hands on doing it, do it yourself first. OK, but in my experience, uh, most people are not DIY personal finance experts. Uh, it reminds me of um, um, uh, William Bernstein's book uh, or his writing. He talks about expecting the average person to um, handle their portfolio is like expecting the average person to fly their own airplane, uh, you know, or to do um, surgery on someone else. Of course, I know we have a pilot on, in the call, so, you know, him aside, for most of us, that's that's a, a good analogy of why well why it's going to be challenging for the normal population to be investing in, in the way that maybe for us is normal. So anyway, back to this. Let's meet them where they are. I personally found this to be very successful, and I now we have several other family mem family members who've also taken on these savings apps, and it's working for them. And hey, more power to them. Okay, we're going to move on here. Be personal and tell them why you care. Okay. Don't inundate them with unsolicited advice. I said that earlier. I would also add here, um, I think emotion is more impactful to people often than numbers. <laughs> and I discovered this, you know, showing spreadsheets to people did not inspire them. Wow. Okay. In many cases. So let's go on here. So be personal. Talk about why this topic matters to you. I mean, I just learned the hard way personally from experience. Uh, I'm going to get further if I'm talking to a family member about this topic, but I just share why, what it means to me. They're like, oh, I'm so happy now. Like, I feel so relieved now that I have some savings, that I have savings. I mean, maybe it could inspire them to talk from, be personal, talk about myself, uh, as opposed to, let me show you my spreadsheet. And have you seen the, the uh, yearly, the 10 year average of, you know, the S&P and how it's growing. Many people are not numbers people. That is my experience anecdotally of most people out in the world. They're not spreadsheet hounds. Uh, many of us are, maybe not all of us, but I think it's just, I think emotion and telling personal stories is a good way to reach people. It's just what I've, the success, whatever success I've found in this area seems to be in communicating comes from that. Share the challenges you faced. At example, at first it was hard to set aside a few dollars, but it got easier. Personally, that's this is kind of underpinning why I started this presentation by talking, being personal about my own challenges. You know, as a teacher, as a communicator, I find that people tend to relate to me if I talk transparently about things. And I think it's true for people in our lives. If you hope to, uh, get them interested in saving, for example, you know, talking about how your difficulties, and maybe it wasn't difficult for everyone else here. I'm, I would not presume that it is. For me, it took a while. And uh, I remember the first time I started investing and, you know, I had to, I remember the moment deciding, yeah, 
I can set aside a hundred dollars a month for this. I think I'm pretty sure I'm going to do this. And I made that decision, but it was, it was a big one. I was paying off debt at the time. I had other money going off in other directions. I made the decision to do that. It was a big deal. And of course, it's been very empowering for me. But again, sharing those kinds of details, I think is, is, is useful when talking to people. Let them know that you care about them and that you believe in them. What I think is really, what I love about this personally is uh, I sometimes made the mistake of, unfortunately, being rather righteous and uh, ending up kind of probably being critical, probably being a jerk with a few family members um, as if I expected them to be like me and why aren't you or something like that. And it just didn't work. And I think a much better approach is to try to just express that, hey, you know what, um, this is something I really care about and I care about you. And I, and I think, I know you you could do this too. I mean, it worked for me and there's a lot of people it's worked for. Uh, and again, I know this is, <laughs> this is a very broad topic today, I'm being very specific, but maybe you can apply the same thought in your life. So you're my family and I know you've been looking for more peace of mind. You've got this. Uh, I think it really, uh, it's there's nothing wrong with making an offer. Like, hey, you know, there's this opportunity, you know, you could set aside a little money. You're, you, I've done this with like, if you're like my nieces, they're young, they're, you know, in their teens and set aside a little money. It could add up after 40 years, it could be all this money, it could be millions of dollars. Now, what I found was that approach didn't work so much. Like I said, it was a little too big and kind of, <laughs> so it wasn't gonna work. But, you know, being personal, starting small, meeting them halfway, see where they are. To show that I care, I could. You've got this. Like I said, there's there's more interest in my family on this idea of how we could set aside some money. Maybe they could, you know, um, have money set aside from an, even an app that does it for them. If that in their in their case, like I said, it's been working in my my family, and I'm glad to have been a, a part of that. And it's all come because I stopped trying to um, <laughs> fix them, save them be the solution and instead just focused on eh, being enthusiastic and being optimistic and open. Okay, be personal. So we got be personal. Moving on, lead by example. This is probably, possibly the most important item on here, uh, which is lead by example, be the change you wish to see in the, in the world instead of trying to change others. To be the what you want them to be. So um, now we got the perfect picture to illustrate uh, this. As you can all see, this guy is clearly leading by example. Uh, I think I really liked his Superman shirt. So, okay. So how do you lead by example? Again, this is no surprise. I think to this people on this on this call, but I'm just laying it out. Thrive in your career. Manage your expenses and debt responsibly. Obviously, your family obligations and money. Um, save and invest, plan for the future, model good financial habits, demonstrate openness around the topic of money. I think this is really important. If you want to call to help cultivate a more open environment around you around this topic, then start by showing an open uh, attitude about it. You know, again, accepting others where they are and then sharing your own story in an open way tends to be fine with people. Oh, that's great. He's nice. He likes me. He cares about me and he's, and he's got interesting, interesting things to share. I think if you're open around the topic, more people around you will be uh, open. Of course, open within reason, whatever works for your situation. Obviously there are, there are limits and so on, but hopefully you get what I mean. Um, Show interest in the financial well-being of people around you while respecting their unique differences and situations. Of course, that's kind of the thesis I'm laying out for this whole talk. Uh, it's very powerful, I think, to be interested in people, not trying to change them, just being interested in them. And uh, these uh, so much follows from that. But I think also, uh, again, this point is mainly about also leading, being the example that you would want to take advice from. If you, if you were in a position of giving advice, you know, get your money house in order, 
Also, I would add, live a life you're happy with. I mean, there's more to life than money, obviously. Health, maybe that's why unconsciously I chose this, this dude who's working out. Um, anyway, health and happiness and other things besides money. Live a life you're happy with. Lead by example. Okay, Gandhi, be the change you wish to see in the world. I did not mean this for be a, to be a pun on change, but you can see there's change in the char. And I also want to say, um, I've always loved this quote, and it feels a little ironic to be using Gandhi with a picture of someone's savings, and because I think of Gandhi as like a, a real, real world change maker. Um, however, I feel really strongly about the powerful value of savings, and I feel passionate about it, dare I say. So to me, it fit, you know, it's a change in the world to be that. And I feel like it does change the world for the better to be, um, to follow these principles we always talk about in the Bogleheads. Okay, lead by example. Now, we're gonna get into a little bit of the relationship uh, area, just briefly. For couples, be transparent about your money. I feel like I should probably pause here for like 30 seconds. Um, just to make a shift. It was a very important one. There's so much about being in a relationship and with money. And I know many of, or maybe all of us, most of us here uh, have this, these experiences too. But this was the one I decided was the one I wanted to share. Was be transparent about your money instead of hiding your finances from your significant other. Think back to the quote from a little while ago about um, uh, couples not sharing with each other how much they make. If a third of them do that, well, this is in, this is worth saying. Even if on this call, it's more likely that we are transparent. So I saw this post, uh, this article uh, on the Washington Post. Four rules to make talking about money with your honey easier. And I liked it. And Michelle Singletary, she said she had four house rules that have helped keep financial peace in my marriage for 31 years. And this is, by the way, not a picture of her and her husband, just a picture from Pexels. But anyway, so the four rules that worked for her. One, commit to being transparent. Every penny spent or earned should be disclosed. No secrets. And I remember on the poll today, uh, most of you said you talk with your you know, spouses and significant others about money regularly. Uh, I do too. Um, maybe we are above average in taking, uh, taking on this one, um, hopefully. But still, worth saying. Um, number two is communicate regularly and then with each other about your finances, your progress on your goals, your net worth, your travel plans, how you, you know, the, the financial part of things. I think we're also above, above average. It's probably quite normal for us in general um, on this call, but not necessarily for everybody. Um, this third one I added because it was on here, not because I understand it. Come up with a code. You need to have a plan to de-escalate disagreements. And I wanted to add it here too, in case anyone on this call, had, uh, and when we discuss this, has their own share, like things that have worked for them in this regard, like a way you handle to navigate disagreements. The woman in the article talked about sort of a, like a little buzz sound they make to indicate they were, I don't know, to diffuse a disagreement. I, I, might, I might not have that completely wrong. It wasn't enough specifics for me to get it. And maybe uh, it's not something I'm, we've taken on, my wife and myself, and maybe we will. But hopefully, maybe someone else has some shed the light on a plan to de-escalate disagreements. Okay, number one, number four, confide in each other. Your partner ought to be your financial best friend. I love the feeling of this one. Share all your fears and frustrations about money. Talk about your goals. I admit, even for me, this feels a little intimidating, but I like it. And I uh, think it's very worthy um, and important uh, and, and something to strive for. And I think I probably tend to be an over, like an over sharer because uh, I believe in the, the importance of communication, certainly with my wife and just with people around me. And I think you can really not go wrong by, in general, by sharing what's up for you. That's what I personally found through life experience. So there you go. Those are her, Michelle's points. And okay. 
Uh, the last do and don't for today is, for me at least, is for parents, engage your children to earn and save. Now I know, as I mentioned, I'm not a parent, but um, I'm, I'm sure this is a very multifaceted, uh, in-depth, it could be a talk on its own. Maybe someone will give a talk on its own in a future meeting on this topic. But, I, but when I thought about it, from my personal experience as a child of parents, I thought, well, this is an important one. I also saw it in several articles I read about allowances and getting, uh, teaching children to, um, to earn and to spend. And I also speak from experience that you don't want to deprive your children of experiences handling money. Because, and this might sound odd, and maybe you didn't go through this, but in a way, I kind of felt like that. Like I, no one did it on purpose, but I got into my young adulthood quite ignorant of the topic and quite fearful because I had just had no experience. So I personally think this is very important, but let's turn to the final article I'll share. This is from uh, 360 Degrees of Financial Literacy, talking to your kids about money. Uh, whether it's helping around the house or getting an after-school job, encourage your kids to make some money of their own. Once they do, talk to them about possible ways to use their earnings, whether it's for an immediate goal such as a toy or trip to the ice cream store or a longer-term target such as a cell phone. Discuss how spending now will mean it will take more time to reach a long-term goal. Getting this perspective can help them decide whether the short or long-term goal is more important to them. Encourage them too to set aside some money for giving. These conversations and experiences will give them a first-hand understanding of how money works and instill good money habits that can last a lifetime. Now, again, I'm sure there are many people on this call who could who could add their own paragraphs of wisdom that I can't on this topic because you've done it yourself. Uh, and uh, again, look forward to hearing from you about that. Personally, though, I, I just love the sound of it. And knowing from my own personal childhood experience, I think I yearned for more clarity and direct experience around money. For whatever reason, I felt sort of somewhat cut off and I sort of developed a bit of an avoidant behavior around it that um, I had to uh, cure myself of <laughs> the hard way by being thrown into adulthood. Um, so I, I, I see the value of this very much. Um, and again, uh, but it's, there's lots to this topic, I'm sure. Um, okay, that is the final do and the final. This will now complete my presentation. Uh, this is a picture of me, um, as you can see. No, this is my, my childhood self. If I, the happy future financial winner and happy happy person that I'm becoming uh, projected backwards. And, and, and anyway, I'm just joking. Um, these pictures, again, courtesy of Pexels.com. I love them. I encourage you to go there. They're free. You can get great pictures. So this completes the presentation. <music>